one Klansman gets beaten up by mistake. <laughs> wonderful that is great he simply came out of the men's room at the wrong time and they were like there's another one and he was like nope and it was you know you can enjoy that chew on that one as we're eating the rest history i'd like to follow me down the rabbit hole history i'd like to frankly Welcome to Hilf, history I'd like to fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody. Now come and grab a seat next to me in the den. That's the Deluxe Edition Network. To find your next favorite podcast in the den, click the link in our show notes or go to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Now this episode, uh, it's a doozy, okay? It is possibly already banned in some states. It's longer than most of my other episodes. And spoiler alert, my guest and I both cry. (laughs) So our story today is that of the Freedom Rides, which is a series of public interstate bus trips taken in the summer of 1961 by activists in an effort to end segregation in the South. Now, the idea is sit in integrated pairs and violate whites-only signs and critically never fight back no matter what happens. Along with them and you and I today is comedian and friend Dave Reinitz, who is not only hilarious, but he's tied to this history personally. His mother, Janet Brom Reinitz, was one of those intrepid riders, and I was fortunate enough to have learned elements of her story that even he hadn't heard before. (laughs) I'm glad you're here. Let's get started. I'm already a little emotional because you came in with the present. Well, of course. It is so nice, though. Oh, it's my pleasure. And it's not just... Dave uh, is a comedian, a visual artist, a teacher. Yes. A writer. A little bit. Yeah. And um, teaches stand-up comedy, but his visual art, I'm looking at it right now. He brought me a stained glass mushroom. Yes, I make stained glass. And it's gorgeous. Thank and you. it's the Packers colors. It's the Packers colors. And I and I, I'm grateful for a number of reasons, but also because you want just any stained glass <laughs> artist. You are the funniest. <laughs> The funniest to count on Etsy. Well, as a comedian. (laughs) Self-proclaimed. Yes. Well, I don't have a lot of comedy credits, or at least not for the last 10 years. And so one of my comedy credits is I do have the funniest page on Etsy. It's true. Yeah. Confirmed. So the the Packers mushroom, which you've been given, was listed on Etsy as, you know, go Packers, except for Brett Favre, because that guy's a piece of shit. (laughs) Who steals from (laughs) poor people. (laughs) <laughs> Who steals from poor people, exactly. I like that. So it's that, nuanced support. Yeah, yeah. What other things other than and mushrooms do you display on your Etsy page? Oh, I've got a uh I've got an iris flower, very uh Georgia O'Keefe looking and very it's vaginal. titled Yeah, and it's it's called a sh- uh come on, it's just a flower. <laughs> <laughs> no. Do you sell a lot? I have never sold anything. Okay, great. Well, but this will be the one. This yeah. is these will be the Hilf listeners are going to come great. in well, it's, full it's, force. It's boom diggity glass on Etsy. Boom diggity glass. Two Ds and two Ts. Get the hence. Get the your own vaginal flower. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of do you do other sports teams besides the Packers? Will you acquiesce to? Uh, well, there's a there's a thing where you can order a custom made mushroom, so I'll make it whatever colors you want if you like. I do some sailboats. I do a lot of. I've been working now with. Um, like old cigar boxes and doing little vignettes with a stained glass background. And cool. Yeah. So I do lots of things. Yeah. It's Ooh, just, diggity. yeah, kind of, I was just, I just did it cause I love doing it. And yeah. I would always give away, you know, so anytime somebody came to my house, I was like, pick something from the window. And so, so cool. all my friends and family have stained glass. And so there was so much of it. My window was just full and I was like, I got to sell some of this. So I set up an Etsy and now Etsy's like, you have to market it. And I, I'm not, Please don't make me do that. Just marketing is just the, it's the bane of my existence. I'm not even good at marketing myself. I'm not going to be great with this little mushroom fella. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. If I could market something, I'd be getting better gigs. (laughs) But your 
gigs aren't that bad. Now you you have been a comedian how long? Let me tell tell me when was your first what you would consider your first quote unquote real gig? I think my first gig was in 1997. I took a stand up comedy class, Greg Dean's comedy workshop. Yeah. And so when we graduated, we got to go to Igby's comedy club and do a spot. So that's when I started doing comedy, and mm-hmm. you know, I was a hobby comic for a lot of years, and then. Yeah. I spent a little bit of time actually making money doing comedy and I didn't enjoy, I don't know, I didn't love to travel and I, I just I hated marketing myself. It's hard. So I came from a restaurant background. So about 2009, I started kicking the tires in some buildings and in 2010 opened two comedy clubs. That's right. And you, one of them is my very favorite Thank comedy you. club in the world, Flappers Comedy Club. You founded that tw- 2010, you said you 2010, opened? we opened 2010. We opened Flappers in Burbank and in, Cal- and in Claremont. Claremont closed in 2018. Um, and then Flappers Burbank is still going strong with uh, Fluffy's there tonight. Yeah. And like, not only is it a great club where you can see everybody. I mean, everybody comes through there and Jay Leno is there every Saturday and it's just this fantastic club. The food is really good. The food's better than it needs to be in a place that has a two item minimum. Like yes. it's really yes. good. But I you guys also, that. I thought the feather in your cap um, for me was during COVID, during the shutdown, that not only did flappers really kind of work to keep comedians doing comedy and audiences able to see comedy yeah, on we all these really, Zoom shows. Yeah, we were really the first people na- nationwide to put comedy on Zoom and really make it accessible and make it work. And, and so it did we're work. really proud of that. And I did over uh, I did over 50 Zoom shows. Wow. You're glad I uh, hated for them all. I hated every single one of them. It was it was like this is literally better than nothing. And so here we are. The best line I heard was that uh, uh, doing comedy on Zoom is like texting a landline. <laughs> 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 yeah, it feels, yeah, it was brutal, but it was, you could tell a joke. You could hear a joke. And yes. Aren't, weren't we grateful? But more than that, you also took care of the community, um, getting food from the kitchen. So keeping your kitchen staff employed simultaneously, well, we, keeping the community fed. It was just really lovely. Yeah. You know, another thing that we did is we did a uh, drive by art gallery. So we had these big posters all around the outside of the building, like 14 posters. And so my mom, who's a painter in New York, and you know she was right in the middle of this whole pandemic. And mm-hmm. I remember talking to her about this idea and she said, yeah, you just have to find somebody to curate that. I said, yeah, I just need to find somebody that knows a bunch of artists. <laughs> 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 and somehow is in touch with me. And it took like a week before she figured out that, yeah, you know. That'd and, be your mom. Yes. And, and it gave her something to do and it gave her, you know, an opportunity to communicate and to continue to be creative and, you know, to enroll her, her community in this project. And so that was, that was a really fun thing to do. Yeah, that was good. And it's a good opportunity to start talking about your mom. Let's start talking about Let's my start mom. talking about your mom because she is why we're here. Because yeah. my mom yeah. was a freedom rider. Yeah. She participated in a freedom ride in 1961. Ride freedom riders if you want to be free rider. So my understanding of like the American Civil Rights Movement was very lily pad, chapter caption-esque, right? In that there was terrible racism. Mm-hmm. And then it got a little better. And then Dr. Martin Luther King made it a lot better. And then it was better. Yeah, that's Congratulations. Not, yeah. And it's... And there'd be like, a, you know, the picture of the March on Washington and a, maybe a sit-in at a segregated lunch counter. And then we were just sort of told, it, certainly when I was growing up in the 1980s, what a woeful, lamentable time that was in our ancient, ancient history. Mm-hmm. And then and in our present day, our, our discussions about race in America... Every, it seems like every time there is an event like George Floyd, a really stark national, sudden, unambiguous moment that has to do with race in America, I think one of the things that keeps coming up is people going, I thought we fixed that. Yes. Well, it's it's comforting to think you fixed it. Yeah. As a white person living in America, it is, hum- it is devastating and humiliating. I absolutely understand an instinct, a reaction to ignore this history, to pretend it is behind us, to not want to talk about it anymore because it doesn't feel good, it doesn't look good, it doesn't say good things. And I jumped into this uncomfortable and unflattering history with both feet and feel real oogie. And I'm very, very um, honored 
to have done it. And I'm grateful. Okay, great. That you put me on this path. All right. I want to tell you about my sources first. Okay. This is called The Freedom Riders. Um, it was written by Raymond Arsenault, and it's fucking fantastic. Um, it outlines all of the individuals involved, gives so much context and backstory. One of the things I valued most about this book was the maps, because sometimes um, my geography would come up against how long it took, for example, for a bus to get from one city to another in 1961. So this map, also, or the maps in here are also incredibly valuable. You can feel free to flip through there as you like. Um, there's also a couple of great podcasts that have a, uh, an audio kind of outline of the events that give you simultaneously the audio you can hear what was going on at the, you know, dialogue, real uh, diegetic action of the time. That is on a podcast called Stuff You Didn't You Missed in History Class, which is great. It's a three-part. It's fantastic. Um, and then, Dave Reinitz, you afforded me the link to the videoed interview that your mother gave for the Library of Congress at the 40th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. It was fascinating. Let me start with my plan for this episode, especially for those of you who are listening from outside of the United States. It's hard to explain the deep cultural difference between the Northern states and the Southern states still today, especially when we're talking about issues of race. I was not, I'm not just a Northern girl. I'm Canada border North, like Minnesota and Wisconsin, right? Which is not to say that we do not have our own racist history. It just isn't tied into slavery and the slave uh, question that brought us into the Civil War. And my relationship with the South was that it was a scary foreign country. I, I was very, very nervous about going into that. My uncles who served in the military during Vietnam would talk about how they would be in training in a Southern state. And if you left the base, you were a damn Yankee and you would get your ass kicked in a bar that they would take the license plates off their cars and drive in the Southern states with no plates because you would be much safer than if you were driving through with Northern plates. And these are white men, white straight men in the military that are scared to simply be a northerner in a southern state. I remember taking road trips with my girlfriends that we would like, we're not going through a deep south state, the three of us girls at night. It's too scary. We're just too vulnerable. It's a, it has a frightening, right, history. Um, and so what I'm going to do, the plan for this episode is to start with context for northerners like me okay. who didn't experience who don't have a lot of experience with what especially the jim crow era of the deep south was like then i'm going to describe those first freedom rides what was the point why did they start where did they go who was on those first rides and then we're going to talk about your mom okay janet's ride all right and i'm so i'm just so excited i'm getting goosebumps okay Starting this Hill of History, Dave Reinitz, is a story. Because I love to just get your toes into 1961. To do that, we got to go back to July of 1944. Okay. And introduce you to a woman named Irene Morgan. Irene Morgan is a resident of Baltimore, but she was born and raised in Virginia. She's a black mother of two who has just had a miscarriage and was recovering at her mother's home in Virginia. It's time to go home to her husband. She's working as a defense contractor. She is actively making weapons for the World War II. And on her way home from her mother's home in Virginia, she gets onto a bus to get to Baltimore. Buses this, work. This is, how, this is how buses work, exactly. And this is in Jim Crow South. And Jim Crow needs definition. So the Civil War ended in 1865. And essentially, those southern states found various ways to continue to treat black people as subservient and diminished to the white race. It is where white supremacy had to find new and creative ways to keep the power struggle as it was. And my, my understanding of Jim Crow is that mm -hmm. Jim Crow actually developed more and more as the Civil War became in the mirror. 
that yes. that it got much worse after the turn of the century yes. and that it was continually getting worse and worse. Absolutely correct. And Jim Crow itself is a derogatory term for a black person. The laws themselves were local and state laws that enshrined segregation into the municipality. So you we've all seen the whites only, colored only water fountain. That's where it comes from. And the first challenge actually to institutionalized segregation had come years and years before. In 1896, Pleasy versus Ferguson was what established, saved segregation, allowed the Southern states to continue to do things like Jim Crow um, because it said separate but equal. You are allowed to say, we want to keep the races separate as long as black people have the same things as the white people, which of course was never... It possible or even an interest of anyone's. And that, you know, case was eventually re- reversed. And we've, we, but at the time, Jim Crow was able to, to be sustained because of the Supreme Court had thought about it and had looked at it and said, yeah, you know, you're allowed to be racist. We can't stop you from being racist. We can just try to protect people. And, and it obviously wasn't working. So the legal structure that justified Jim Crow Yes. Was separate but equal. Separate but equal. That was the that was the federal like once the federal government said, OK, as long. And what the idea was then is, yes, you can obviously separate the races as long as everyone has the same thing. This doesn't mean, however, if I am a black person going to a bus stop, I see a whites only section. It doesn't mean there's going to be a blacks only section. And even if it did. They are not ever equal. And we started to see how quickly this was being pushed and when they would shut down public schools, say, fine, then we will not educate any of the children in our state if you're telling me our children have to be educated next to black people. It's part of where stupid Southerners comes from because they stopped going to school because they would rather stop going. Wow. And there were, they would still have small schools that were white only, but they weren't getting quality education there. It wasn't like it was able to live up to a standard. They, they, they would cut off their own arms constantly to, to prevent themselves from having to embrace was the word, something they didn't like. Was the word apartheid ever used? Not that I have seen... If it was used in a speech or something like that, it may have, but it wasn't part of like legislation. Okay. Um, but this is the landscape Irene Morgan is dealing with in July of 1944 when she gets on that bus in Virginia. She lives in Maryland where black and white people are treated comparatively equally, but she's in Virginia. She knows the Jim Crow laws. So she gets on the bus leaving mother's house and she goes to the back where the black people are going and she's following the rules. And it's packed. The whole bus is packed. There's nowhere to sit. So she's standing and eventually another black woman offers her her lap to sit on. And so she sits on the black. And then as people, passengers are coming and going, eventually seats open up. And so, you know, whoever was standing the longest ends up kind of sitting down. And then just by chance, she finally gets to sit and she's only three rows from the back, still in the black only section. But some white people have sat behind her. The reason being, no matter what seat is open, even if the seat that's open is in the black section, a white person will take it before a black person will. So no white person would be standing ever if a black person was sitting, right? But there were seats for everybody. So these white people just ended up sitting down behind her. The bus driver says, no, even though you're not sitting together, you can't be in front of a white person. So get up for crying out loud. And Irene Morgan says no. Now, the black woman who was sitting in her seat next to her has a little baby. She's up like popcorn and goes straight to the back of the bus, uh, following the rules, nodding. Yes, of course. And Irene Morgan just sits there and says no. And then she goes, how about this? I trade. The white people can take my seat. I'll move back. So I'm still behind the white people, but like we'll swap. And the driver says, no, you fucking stand. Because I told you to. She refuses again. He calls the sheriff. The sheriff comes to arrest her. She refuses to go. He uh, grabs her. She kicks him. She says years later in an interview that she wanted to bite him, but he looked dirty. (laughs) (laughs) 
That's fantastic. <laughs> she goes to jail for seven days. Eventually, her mother pays the $500 bond, and she's found guilty of two things, resisting arrest and violating Jim Crow segregation laws. The fine for resisting arrest is $100. She says, I did that. And she pays her $100. Which is an enormous amount of money. An enormous amount of money. The fine for violating the Jim Crow segregation was $10. And she says, go fuck yourself. I'm not paying that one. Wow. She appeals the $10 fine to the Supreme Court. Really? And the NAACP. And this was 1944. This is in 1944, so July this is of 1944. 10 years before Rosa Parks. Very well done. Yes. And the uh, NAACP um, goes all the way, is part of her lawsuit, and she wins. Yay! Morgan versus Virginia, the Supreme Court in 1946. And this is, I'm going to read you a quote from that decision. Uh, they, they argue, of course, there's no federal segregation law. And the bottom line is a black American who begins an interstate journey in a free Jim Crow free set state should be free to travel through states and not lose their rights along the way. You cannot simply be, have less rights because you've gone from one state into another. So this is, this is again the domination of a federal law over a state law. Correct. And the federal government says, it seems clear to us that seating arrangements for different races and interstate motor travel requires a single uniform rule to promote and protect natural travel. So that's the law of the land. You can sit wherever you want on an interstate bus. Now, this has nothing to do with where you sit on a bus going within the state of Virginia. But if you're interstate travel, you are federally protected from segregation. This is in 1946 this decision comes out. That's okay. the year Jackie Robinson gets signed to the Dodgers. Irene Morgan has, is living a quiet life now as a nurse, and she says this would abolish Jim Crow for Northerners going south. She was relieved to hear that Jim Crow tension had been removed. Wow, so she thought this was it. She sure did. And she wasn't the only one. You know, wow. people are like, well, there we go. House of cards coming down. Right. And the primary organizations working for civil rights at this time, some of them, which you mentioned already, CORE, C-O-R-E stands for the Congress of Racial Equality. They were formed in 1942. FOR, F-O-R, is the Fellowship of Reconciliation. They're, they're working specifically on trying to kind of reunite after this, I mean, that old, old wound from the Civil War. And these are both segregated organizations. They are integrated organizations. Integrated organizations. Yep. That's what yep. I meant to say. Integrated yes. Integrated organizations at the leadership level, black and white, yes. And the NAACP is a complicated one. This is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It is the oldest, biggest organization in the civil rights arena in the United States. And so it has some of the burden of being the biggest, oldest organization. The NAACP is super focused on changing laws. Let's find lawsuits like Irene Morgan's that we can use to go all the way to the Supreme Court that we can use to change these laws. And then they would sort of be like, we did it. Whereas CORE and FOUR were more into direct action, nonviolent specifically, but direct action. They would then sort of take the football from passing these Supreme Court legislations, and their goal was to test it. Laws are only as powerful as they are enforced. And now we've got this Supreme Court ruling in our back pocket. And in 1947, they go, let's do, let's test it. Let's take an interstate ride and see how this new Supreme Court ruling does. See if anybody buys it. And it is called the Journey of Reconciliation. They have, they go into the Upper South because there is absolutely no question what will happen to them in 1944 if they try this in the Deep South. And I'll clarify what is the Deep South from the Upper South uh, as we go. Um, and there are some arrests. A couple of guys get arrested for sitting in a, in a segregated area, and they say, but there's the Morgan versus Virginia decision, and they are taken to jail and fined and spend a few months on a chain gang and then are bailed out. But it doesn't. You didn't know it had happened. And you're very tied into the Freedom Ride history. Most people didn't hear anything about it. It made no splash at the time. Most of our history books, if it's mentioned, would be simply to say that the 1961 Freedom Rides weren't the first. 
So, so you're saying this was 47, and they, they tried to challenge, they tried to get a ruling to support the law that had been passed. It was less that uh, CORE was almost never trying to do anything legally or legislatively. They were testing the laws that, that existed. Great. Yeah. So, so they, were, they were putting it to the test. Correct. And it failed. Correct. Well, a little bit. That was their determination, actually. If you look at the landscape then in 1946, 47, this law was just passed. We did a semi-successful ride with how they looked at it. Some of them got arrested, but then they were let out eventually. Most, some of the places we went, they didn't give us any trouble at all. Okay. And then Jackie Robinson's doing, you know what? I think we're probably in the, in the end of that dark, dark period of racial seg- segregation. And then, Dave, the thing that happens often where you go... Seven years later, Brown versus the Board of Education. Tick, tick, tick. Nothing's really in the day-to-day lives of most of these people. They're like, where? I'm not going to a different school. This is it's not changed. What the fuck, man? Eight and a half years later, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on the bus and doesn't have much easier go of it. And at this point, my friend, Dave Reinitz, after waiting and some legislative wins, there were, there were for example, in the 1960s, the sit-ins that, that successfully had desegregated lunch counters and when did, when in did, several places. When did Dr. King really come to prominence? A huge event was when he was arrested in 1960 in the Deep South. And the question is, are they going to kill Dr. King in this prison? Because they had released a lot of the people that he was with, and he would be released, but then not released, and then we didn't know where he was and what jail have they? This they've moved him to another jail, and this is when, yeah, and this is when uh, John F. Kennedy, candidate Kennedy, calls Coretta Scott King. Can't do anything for her technically; he's not president yet. But it's that call that is that show of support. I wish I could help you. This is very unjust. What's happening? That arguably won him the presidency really? at the end of that year because black people and people who were supportive of civil rights were like, finally. The reality is the Kennedys weren't terribly interested in civil rights, but that gesture was still significant enough at the time that people are looking around going, here we fucking go. But that is that is so emblematic of the Democratic Party's relationship with Africa, with the African American community, mm-hmm. which is that we're going to put on a show, mm-hmm. we're going to get you on our side, mm-hmm. and we're so much better than them, and and so what Kennedy did was he manipulated, mm-hmm. and he marketed himself as a civil rights guy to mm-hmm. get that vote, but then truly as a president he was not an effective advocate for civil rights at all. No, and and a lot of people will argue that it's. Yeah, they, they were tra- that they knew it the whole time. This guy's given us empty promises, but there's that voice that says at least he's saying the right thing. Yes, but well, my my mom, who mm. actually worked for uh, Lyndon Johnson, mm-hmm. um, was always angry at Kennedy, mm-hmm. and always you know people would laud Kennedy and what a great president, and she would say no, it's a bullshit story. Kennedy was not a civil rights leader at all, and if anything, got in the way of the civil rights movement more than he helped it. And there's the same accusations are often made by certain individuals within the NAACP at the same time. Because I told you that the core was like, sit in, freedom rides, let's test these laws. And the NAACP is like, you're fucking this up, man. They are accusing us of trying to blow everything up. We're, ju- we're trying to bring rape. We're going to try to get interracial marriage next. Right. And every time you guys go out over your skis, we have a harder time doing the work in the courts. And so even within the civil rights organization for people who full throatedly have the same goals, they're pushing each other back. Yes, there was constant tensions between totally. between core, between Dr. King, and between Malcolm X. Yeah, and the idea of having Malcolm X out there as the radical would make core and Dr. King seem more palatable. Mm-hmm. But core and Dr. King had very, very different strategies mm-hmm. and very different ideas. And also recognized that they were part of the same movement, even yes. if they were they they had sort of hands on each other. Yeah, same, recognizing same, their differences and their and same their goals. But how do we get there? Totally. However you believed JFK, wherever he was, when he got elected at the end of 1960, what you had at the very least was someone who said they were in favor of 
the effort to integrate and fight for the civil rights of Southern blacks. And you had a young guy. Just the image and the feeling of a young president that kind of got the era was enough to inject the movement and people in the movement with a sense of like, the iron is hot, the times are now, and let's go. Now, these organizational members, I told you about CORE and FOR and the NAACP who'd been around since the 40s, were part of Irene Morgan's movement, are looking around smelling that. Yeah, 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 yeah time. And they go, remember that journey of reconciliation that they did in 1946. It's time to do it again. But now it's the sixties baby and journey of reconciliation ain't going to sell freedom ride. Will marketing. (laughs) These kids understood marketing, right? They're the tight, hot name, the freedom rides. And they make a plan. primary individuals, the most significant, like the brain trust of the early freedom ride, um, comes down to three men. Um, Bayard Rustin, he's considered the intellectual godfather kind of of the freedom rides. He's black. He's a Quaker. So he has a a, a generational nonviolence history and he's gay. For that reason, he's not physically present on most of these rides because he's already moved to Paris because he can't be black and gay. It's not great, right? James Peck is white, Harvard grad, comes from a very wealthy family, and he fought for civil rights out of a pure sort of revelatory moral choice. He rejected his wealthy parents. He brought a black date to his first dance at Harvard and got kicked out and was like, go fuck yourself. He's a radical journalist. He's our guy. And James Farmer is kind of the third leg of that stool. He's a founding member of CORE. He's black. He's from the South. Um, Most of the other founding members were from the North. Um, And they're like, okay, the Freedom Rides, 1961, it lets go. And here's the plan. We're going to start in Washington, D.C. We're going to get groups of volunteers that are going to, quote unquote, test the Jim Crow laws on interstate travel. That means we're going to have in equal distribution, about eight to 16 volunteers on each bus. We're going to have them old, young, black and white, religious and secular, in the movement forever, brand new to the movement. We're going to have a wide variety. They had women too, but they did always have fewer, much fewer women because the idea is they'd integrate each bus with a black person and a white person, but they couldn't put a black man with a white woman. They were like, that's a different fight. <laughs> We'll get there. That will take us into a different direction. So let's just stick with race at this point. And um, they would not only challenge the segregation on the bus itself, but because of some of the strides that have been made since Irene Morgan's case, federally, technically, those lunch counters and waiting rooms in the bus stations were also not to be segregated for interstate travel. So they were just going to go pick a route that started in D.C. and ended in New Orleans. They would stop and they would just every leg of the thing, they'd buy a bus ticket. They'd get on the bus. They'd go into the thing. They'd go into the waiting room. They'd sit down together at the counters and literally let's just see if we get arrested. And and if we do, we'll challenge it. So they would they would have people that would get on at the southern bus stops or they were all coming they were all starting off in the north everyone starts in washington dc and ends in new orleans because that part of the law is where you started right right and where you yeah exactly um and primarily to non-violence because a lot of these original core members were motivated by gandhi gandhi was their primary influence and it was about the d segregation of Asia and Africa, that, that, that they were like, we have to do it like that. So they were so devoted to nonviolence, they would have a week of training prior to getting on the bus that they used with, with p- folks who had participated in the sit-ins. They would role play with one another to be prepared for the words, just to hear these screaming, angry people is a thing that gets your heart rate up and let's just practice, you know? Similarly, they didn't bring anything that could even be construed as a weapon. No nail files. No nail files, because even if you are truly dedicated to nonviolence, we can't have you accused right. of trying to start anything. I'm going to give you a lot of specifics, because I think you have to hear what they were screaming. I think you have to see how long they were kicked. Watch how many boots kicked in how many ribs to go, 
holy fuck, this was a war, man, right? So the first volunteers to get on this first freedom ride that is leaving on May 4th, 1961. JFK has been in, inaugurated in January, so we're months into his presidency. It's party time! Get up! Jim Heck is going. James Farmer is going. So those two founding members are going as volunteers. Uh, Genevieve Hughes is a beautiful northern white lady. Uh, She's similar to James Peck. She comes from a very wealthy background. She's rejected her parents' way of moving. She uh, is deeply devoted to the civil rights movement. Walter and Frances Bergman are a Jewish couple in their 60s who used to be educators and had decided to do this together. Oh, this guy. My arms are wrapped around myself. Albert Bigelow. He's 55. He's built like a fucking tank. He's a white guy. He's a former Navy captain. Wow. He was revolutionized when we dropped the A-bombs at the end of World War II and became a pacifist overnight. Because he understood the unnecessariness of that act. I think, you know, he. you can read some of his thoughts on it, um, and they're eloquent and beautiful, but it really is uh, remarkable to see a guy who looks like G.I. Joe and who sounds... (laughs) like a a 55 year old Navy captain who will not hurt you because he's deeply devoted to nonviolence and is here to change things. It's just a very kind of, uh, um, he's a remarkable character. Um, Jimmy McDonald, he's 29. He's a black folk singer from New York city. Um, Ed Blankenship, he's 27, a carpenter's apprentice, former Marine, who is from the North, but had been stationed in the South during his training and was completely gobsmacked by how black people retreated in the South. He really had no idea. Um, John Moody is a really interesting one. He's 30 and he's a, a Northern uh, um, guy, black. He's, he's from Howard and he was super self-conscious because he had cousins from the South who would come and visit him and would tell him what it was like being black in the South and how they were treated. And he had um, something akin to embarrassment, not really jealousy, but like I'm not experiencing what my black cousins are experiencing. I have a completely different kind of life. So he was motivated to join the movement because he had it pretty good, you know? Charles Parson is the youngest. He's 18. He had to have his parents' permission. He had to have, <laughs> they had to sign a note that said it was okay. You've got Reverend Benjamin Elton Cox. He's 29. He's one of the oldest ones um, on one of the buses, and he wears his reverend collar. Not just, they, they didn't just want a, a person of faith. They wanted them to be a vis- wear your clergy outfit. John Lewis, of course, the famous civil rights icon. He was 21 at the time. Um, Charlotte Devery, she starts as a journalist. She was just covering it. She's a white lady who was just going to cover the rides, and she ends up putting her notebook down, and she's like, I'm in. I'm not leaving, and I'm part of this. So it's a wide variety of people from a wide variety of backgrounds, all committed to nonviolence. All committed to nonviolence. All committed to, to, to this process to challenge the law, to try to... And uh, segregation as we know it in Jim Crow. Exactly, exactly. And um, have gone through this training together. And the training part, you know, because my mom used to talk about the training Mm -hmm. and what a significant thing that was. Mm -hmm. And as she participated in different movements later in her life, one of the things that she lamented was the lack of organization and cohesive training. So we all knew what to expect. Mm -hmm. We We all knew how to present ourselves. We all knew how to react and how valuable that was, Mm -hmm. and how meaningful it was. Mm -hmm. It also was, um, I think, important in moments of fear and trepidation. The plan Mm -hmm. was detailed enough that it would be like, when we get to this stop, you two will go to the restroom. You two will go to the lunch counter. You two, and so you had your designated testers, the ones who knew they were going to be the ones to walk up. So there wasn't that moment when you're getting off the bus going, okay, so who wants to, um, Correct. it's like, no, we've already, Correct. it's it was, already It set. was well planned. And, well and, planned. and like I said, that was one of her mm-hmm. big criticisms of movements in, 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 that have mm-hmm. taken place since then is a lot of it is just very haphazard. Mm-hmm. It's very just emotion based. We're just, I'm going to go out there and hang the sign and whatever happens, happens, as opposed to this very tactical, very thoughtful. Mm-hmm very understanding way to go about, 
you know, what they're trying to accomplish. That's right. And I think among the reasons for that, none of which are very good, is because of corrupt organizations or even a little of what we see in this history, which is NAACP versus CORE. Because the NAACP said to the Freedom Riders when they set out on May 4th, you're on your own. We do not promise that we will represent you if you get arrested. We are not going to, as we often have, shuttle our busload of lawyers down there to bail your asses out. We think it's pretty provocative, actually. We're not going to go so far as to say don't do it or we don't think you should do it. But we are making it clear that that is not an NAACP activity and that we have nothing on our hands. Okay. Wow. And I think that. Sometimes that is one of the reasons that people say, you know, we're going to do this on our own without leadership because we don't want to be derailed by some sort of odd internal workings of some divided corporate brand, which isn't unreasonable, but does tend to stop progress. Right. But they've got it all laid out. They know who's going. They've got their plan. And on May 4th, 1961, they get on the bus in Washington, D.C., and they head south. And I'm reading this part of the book. I'm goosebumps right now. I'm reading this thing like, what? Okay, first stop's okay. I mean, I'm feeling like it must have been what it was like for the writers. It's a countdown. It is. And I get through, and good. I mean, and you start to feel it. First stop, no problem. No problem. Second stop, the bus driver's not yelling at anybody. No one, no one, no other passengers. Because keep in mind, they're not, it's not like they rented a coach. Right. This is a public bus. bus. They bought a ticket on it. That means that bus has a bunch of other passengers who may or may not be into this, who may or may not participate. And they're even saying, one of you, your job is to educate the bus. So we're just going to sit down. And what do you do if somebody goes, hey, another passenger just goes, hey, you can't sit with her. We explain what we're doing, who we are, where we're from, what our point is. The federal law that was just passed and they found that in these first several stops, it was like a fucking retreat, man. People were generally super cool about it. Because they're still up north. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're in the, uh, yeah, they're in the (laughs) upper north. They're they're technically in the south, but they're in the upper south. So for those of you who are like, "Mm, my geography isn't great. We're talking Virginia. North Carolina. It even has North so in the name. Tennessee. They're, they're, they're getting mm. over there, and that's not... It's not terrible. Even a little bit of Northern Georgia, things are going great. They've even found that some of the whites only, uh, colored only signs have been taken down or painted over, which they should have been, because that was a law that was passed between Morgan and now, and they're like... And they even say the final faithful things that you should never say on any kind of journey ever. Everything's going so well, <laughs> right? Um, the first arrest uh, happens um, of, to Joe Perkins. He sits down arrest? at a, arrest. Can you believe it? He want, he sits down to get his shoe shined, and the black guy who's shining shoes says, "No, <laughs> I will be fired if I shine. <laughs> I can only fi- white guy shoes only, man. Like you got to get out of here." He's arrested. He's arrested for released. trying to get his shoes shined. Yes, because it's a not for you. Rock Hill, South Carolina, there is some violence. A group of, of toughs, they call them local toughs, uh, take a shot at John, Lu- punch, try to, sh- try to push John Lewis down, basically, as he's walking into a waiting room and he's kind of heading for the whites only area and they, read the, and they just shove him down. And Hi. Al Bigelow just stands in front of him. The, our big fucking Navy guy doesn't push back because, again, nonviolence. He just stands in front of of John Lewis and takes a few punches, but John Lewis gets up and it's okay. Genevieve Hughes, our babe white girl, also gets pushed and shoved to the ground when she tries to stand between some of the black riders. Now, how did these people know what was going on on that bus? That is an excellent question. Word is starting to spread, but also bus drivers. Now, remember how we said they didn't rent the coach. Right. So your roll of the dice. As to what kind of a bus driver Is you the get. driver and is all the passengers. And yeah, for the first few, regardless of their personal feelings, they were on their heels. This is happening. Okay. As the word starts to spread, they do. Not only are they going further south, but they're being more known. Yeah. So when they get to Atlanta... They've started to feel some pressure. They've had some verbal altercations. They've been pushed, but they haven't been beaten. And their arrests, they've been able to make bail and get out. And then the guy who was arrested got to join the bus again. He caught up with them. And they're like, okay, okay. And they get to Atlanta. And because the news is spreading, they know when they get to Atlanta, they're going to have dinner with Martin Luther King. 
And wow. what they're hoping is, yeah. So now huge. this is a, this is a public event. Now people know that the Freedom Ride is it's coming. It's not like an advertised thing to people within the community. So they would have told the local ch- church and the local civil rights leaders in Atlanta were com- They knew they were coming, but was this published in any kind of like newspaper? Probably not. Core would have been discussing it, right? But they're not really interested in advertising. This but as but as soon as Dr. King gets involved, mm-hmm. I mean that's this obviously be great. a yeah. thing. And they're like, we're going to see Dr. King. We're going to have dinner together. He's going to bring so. So much um, validity, gravitas. power, gravitas, publicity, and maybe if we're super lucky, he'll get on the bus and he'll actually ride with us. If he gets on the bus and rides with us, this is going to be fucking nuts. We're changing history, man. Okay. And they sit down for dinner, with Dr. King, and it's like, holy fuck. But instead of bolstering their hopes and getting on the bus with them, he pulls Farmer and Peck aside at dinner and says, you will never make it out of Alabama. Stop. Don't do it. This is 61. So Emmett Till was? Um, Emmett Till was 55. Was, was a while back. And yet, Dr. King knows no one is necessarily going to win here if you're all murdered in Alabama, which is your next stop. Don't go. And then Alabama he, ain't North Carolina. Alabama is Alabama isn't even South Carolina girl. <laughs> so don't go. And when we come back from the break, we'll find out what they did. <laughs> this podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to Deluxe Edition Network.com. That's Deluxe Edition Network.com. Wherever there are rules, there is someone going astray. Sex, sleaze, and shady power moves, it's a story as old as time. I'm Kiki Anderson. As a comedian and former journalist, not a lot surprises me anymore. But as we stumble through a doomed world and a digital hellscape, it can drive you crazy trying to make sense of what is and isn't kosher. On Indecent, I'm peeling at the wallpaper of polite society to understand the why and the who behind our taboos. Come along for the ride as I explore everything from porn to politics, tech, and religion. If you can't get through the day without, you know, rubbing one out in the bathroom stall at the office, you got a problem. There's a big community around people trying to trade tips and like tricks on on how to suck your own d- and like just many different pages of threads about this. And then people kind of create like friendships through this. Subscribe, rate, and review Indecent with Kiki Anderson on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Also go to ncpodcast.com slash indecent to learn more. Indecent with Kiki Anderson, where NSFW meets LMAO. Before we join up again with our courageous freedom riders, a shout out to those intrepid few who have come aboard my bus my patrons. <laughs> Please welcome our latest throbbing member, Colleen R. As in, are you ready to be boarded? <laughs> Colleen and her fellow patrons are not only above average intellectually, they help keep the history coming by providing me with the funding for the book subscriptions and hardware necessary to go down into the annals again and again and again. In turn, my patrons get early access to new episodes and bonus episodes in the weeks in between. Want in? Check out What's What at patreon.com slash hilfpodcast. Then head over to Instagram and... Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow. Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow. Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow. So this is why I get hot for history. My blood is boiling. I'm sweating. My legs are shaking. I'm having so much fun. Well, it's such an interesting story, and there's so much. There's so many interesting characters, and it's such a, you know, for me, there's so much totally. personal context. Well, and and this next part, I just want to put a put a little highlighter on it for my friend Dave. I know you lost your mother in May, and May is Mother's Day, and this incredibly stirring part of the story takes place on Mother's Day in 1961. Okay. As our group of intrepid freedom riders on that first journey cross into the state of Alabama against Dr. King's um, suggestion. 
What's nuts about that, so it's on the, I mean, they feel like they're on the edge of a cliff going into Alabama. Jim Farmer and Jim Peck, uh, Jim Peck is white, Jim Farmer is black, are the leaders. They're the organizational leaders. They're the Mac daddies of this movement. They are and, consciously, <clears throat> consciously yes, risking their lives. Absolutely. And Jim Farmer gets a call from home that his father has died. Oh. And his mother is pleading with him to come home for the funeral. And he's like, oh, my goodness. Not only is this my baby, this ride, but this is the hardest part. We're entering Mordor tomorrow, you know? And he doesn't know when he's... And he goes to his father's funeral. And he says in his autobiography that I was relieved, which embarrassed me to tears. The other one who leaves at that point is John Lewis, who is going to accept a job interview of a lifetime, a chance to be a part of a huge civil rights uh, movement that was going to be going to India. He would have a huge educational um, uh, windfall. And he was like, I will be back. It's just an interview. Like, I have to go and I have to do it and then I'll come right back. So he's gone too. So then they got some Freedom Riders to come fill in for him. So they got two more guys. And and those guys are now like, okay, fun. We get to start now. Alabama. Goody. <clears throat> Let's go. Um, keep in mind, too, there are two buses. There is the Greyhound bus line and the Trailways bus line. And the Freedom Ride has Freedom Riders on both of those buses. And they're going in not quite identical routes, but it's parallel. So they end up in the same city on the same evening, but the bus stations are, of course, going to be just a little further apart because it's the Greyhound station and the Trailway station, but they've generally been scheduled to be running parallel. The first story you're going to hear is from the Greyhound bus that first enters Alabama on Mother's Day, 1961. Don't worry about me. On that bus, along with the Freedom Riders, are, as I've mentioned, unaware passengers. People. People. <laughs> Who are like, nice day. I'm visiting Happy my Mother's aunt. Day. I'm going to go see Ma. <laughs> right? You also have journalists, some of whom have been with them the whole time. You have one of the, of the Freedom Riders is always the designated witness. Mm -hmm. Don't get arrested. You've got to go get our lawyer. You've got to. You are the one who just stays out of You're it. You're the watcher. Watches. Watcher. Yes. On this bus is also Roy Robinson, who is the manager of the Atlanta Greyhound station. So he, where they're leaving, and he is not, he, I don't know if he's incognito, but he's not riding as the Greyhound manager. He's just along to keep an eye on things. Sort of ambiguous why exactly he's there. A representative of the company. Yeah, who's not trying to do any fucking thing. He just kind of wants to be there, right? There's also two plain closed members of the Alabama Highway Patrol, two corporals, um, Eli Cowling and Harry Sims. And none of the Freedom Riders or the driver, nobody knows who they are. Just two white guys hanging out. Their first inkling that there's something up is when they are heading towards Anniston, Alabama, and the bus, the Greyhound bus that is going the opposite direction towards them, waves down the driver and says, you're going to get attacked when you get to Anniston. There is a huge mob gathering out they there. They know you're coming. And they're waiting for you. The Freedom Riders managed to convince the bus driver to go. And they're doing that by saying it's legal. We're protected by the federal government. Don't you know about the Supreme Court? And they're doing all of their education stuff. Like, trust us, the our nation has our back kind of deal. They get to the Aniston station, and it's eerily quiet. Eerily quiet. Like, like, nobody's there. It's a bus station. Where's everybody? And they get off the bus, and they go up to the station, and the doors are locked. And as they're trying to open the doors just to go in to do this testing, the mob runs in. 50-plus men carrying pipes, chains clubs one guy lays right down in front of the tires of the bus so they can't drive away and this and the the riders of course all run back onto the bus and close the door and lock the doors behind them and this mob smashes the windows slashes the tires they're trying to tip the bus over which they can't quite do despite their best efforts 
they're trying to get on the bus to open that door to get on the bus. And the driver, I mean, everybody got back on the driver and everybody. And now these two plainclothes highway patrolmen have run to the front and they're holding that door shut too. They are putting, they're throwing their bodies into it. Right. Cause nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows who anybody is. And they obviously don't care. The mob doesn't care. However, then this starts this little stand. Finally, we, got, we can't tip the bus over. We can't get on. They're not coming off. And so the clan and the voice pieces for the mob say, send the riders out. Just find who the freedom riders are. You send them out. We'll give them what's coming to them, and the rest of you can go. But they don't do it in their to their credit, right? Eventually, it's getting worse and worse and worse. The bus is dented. The police do police like they weren't already there. Show up and kind of lovingly disperse. <laughs> lovingly. <laughs> lovingly disperse the crowd. That's enough, fellas. We love you. I mean, that's what Trump said, right? right? We love you. We understand what you're doing. It's time to go. So they do. And then they, the police look at the bus driver and the bus and go, go ahead and go. The tires are slashed. The windows are broken. Mm -hmm. And they go, okay. And they, right? Let's get the fuck out of Dodge. They're at least telling us we can go. So they drive so off. So they on drive off onto the highway, and the police follow them to the town line. And not only do the police disappear, but there is a line of cars waiting for them, and there's a line of cars that followed them. And it's just like not our problem. Run, and the bus just goes as far as it can. These cars circle the bus. They're screaming, and, and the the riders are saying one of the things that struck them the most was that they were wearing their Sunday best. They have their kids in the car. They're coming home from church. It's It was such a it's strange... Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day. And they are hanging out the window, and they're screaming, and they're yelling, and they finally... The bus actually can't go any further, and they hobble. The bus sort of rolls to a stop between the city of Anniston and Birmingham, right outside of this little grocery store. The driver and Rob uh, Roy Robinson, the great run off the bus kind of like as fast as they can to get to the grocery store. And they're like, we may basically need a new bus. Get the call Greyhound and get a new bus out here so that we can get out of here. And the mob comes in so fast that the doors are shut. The, the passengers who are still on the bus close the door and the mob surrounds the bus again. I have visions of the walking dead. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, uh, exactly. It would have felt very much like that, right? And they're thinking, now what the fuck do we do? In the meantime, our guy, Eli... Um, let me get their last names again. Eli, Eli Cowling. The two undercover cops. The two, yeah, the two undercover cops at this point got their guns out of the baggage. Wow. And they are blocking that door and saying, fuck no. No one's getting on this bus. You're not doing, no one's doing anything. And they're kind of running interference. I don't, I've never heard in any of the accounts that they disclosed who they were, but their revolvers were making a significant difference sure. in the way that everybody was behaving. Eventually, this standoff, this dialogue runs out of gas and two of the members of the mob throw a Molotov cocktail through a broken window and it fills the bus fast with fumes and with smoke. They can't see their lungs are burning. A few of the freedom riders and the passengers at this point, it's almost not necessary to differentiate because their treatment is in no way differentiated at this point are able to slide out the windows open the windows just enough to, that they've leaned their heads up, that they're able to slide out and they hit the ground. In the meantime, the rest of the passengers are trying to get out and the mob is now blocking the door. They've been trying to open it. Now right. they've blocked the door and they're yelling, let them burn. Prepared to just watch this busload of people burn to death because some of them might have been freedom riders and many of them are white. They know they're white. <laughs> They can see that. They just don't know who's a freedom rider, and they've refused to differentiate, so let them burn. Wow. And they would have all burned to death in that bus, except a fuel tank exploded. So a fuel tank explodes. The mob backs off long enough that they get off the bus, and they're on the ground coughing and practically paralyzed from smoke inhalation, which is when they get the shit kicked out of them. While they're down coughing, they are just beaten within an inch of their lives. Many of them fall unconscious. The two undercover cops get their guns out, stand between them, block 
the riders and the passengers who've been beaten. Wow. Saying, you're going to have to fucking come through us, man. And these are Alabama state troopers. Alabama Highway Patrol. Highway, highway Patrol. And most people agree that the mob would have just killed, was about to come in and kill him. Take a bullet, maybe, but beat them all to death. But another fuel, t- uh, fuel tank explodes. <laughs> and the mob moves back. And at this point, there's this odd uh, standoff. Mm-hmm. Where the bus is fucking burning. The bus is burning. And the, the f- riders and the passengers are actually cowering within the heat and fumes of the bus because it's what keep is keeping the mob off of them. So they're sort of... Half the bus is burning. Yeah. And then they're taking shelter in the other half of the bus. No, the bus, they're off the bus they're entirely. They're off the bus. But they're staying close to a burning bus because that burning bus is the reason they're not completely encircled and already dead. Got because it. the mob is actually it's actually smells really bad and it's really hot, <laughs> right? And so there's this standoff, like, what are we going to do with these people? And there's no, and a, the only act of humanity in this entire town from anyone comes from a 12-year-old girl. <laughs> Fuck, I cried first. Shit. Um, a 12-year-old girl named Janie Forsyth, who is white and walks between all of these people and brings bucket after bucket to them on the ground so they can drink and wash their faces and hands. And she walks between the screaming violent men and listens to their verbal abuse, but they're not hitting her. And she just goes back again and again and again at 12 at 12. And when this entire incident is over, she and her family are so abused. They have to move. They are unforgiven. Eventually, the cops, as I said, who have already been there, fire a gun into the air. You're done. So the mob leaves. They're sitting there bleeding, burned, and broken, and no ambulance will come. No one will help them. (laughs) No one will pick them up. No one will give them a ride anywhere. They're just stuck there on the side of the road with a burning bus. And finally, one of them highway patrol guys is like, fuck, and they get an ambulance. Finally, an ambulance comes out. And they're like, fuck, and they're heaving their sad sacks into this ambulance. And the driver says, not the black ones. I I de-stooped to pick you fucks up, but I'm not letting the black ones on. And so the white riders get out of the ambulance. Wow. (laughs) And go, then, sounds like we got to figure something out too. Wow. And our highway patrolman again says to the ambulance driver, I think you should just take them all. And who knows what motivates people, but the ambulance driver relents and does take them to the hospital, which is already surrounded by Klan members who won't let them into the hospital. Eventually, they get into an emergency room through a back door, and they threaten to burn the hospital down if they're treated. Wow. Their own own community hospital. Mm -hmm. And this is such a rural place. And they and the facilitators and the administrators look out the window and see the fire department is right there and the police are right there and they're telling us they're going to burn it down. So who will? Let's just say they do. No one obviously is going to save the hospital because they're the ones burning it down. So the hospital administrator says to the Freedom Riders, "You have to go. <clears throat> Get out. You have twenty minutes." Exactly. And they're like. Pfft. Okay. Now, in the meantime, all sorts of people are making calls. And Al Bigelow, simply because he was a Navy captain, has a guy of a guy who calls the White House, calls the, you know, the Washington, D.C., puts a call into government very generally. And nothing happens, of course. But they do call their buddy Fred Shuttlesworth. And Fred Shuttlesworth is a a pastor in Birmingham, and he runs the Bethel Baptist Church. He's an outspoken advocate for the civil rights. He's living in Birmingham, walking and talking, this walk and talk every day. And is he he a white guy or a black guy? He's a black guy. He's a black guy. And he is, gets a call. The Freedom Riders um, have been burned and beaten, and they're in a hospital, and they're about to be fed to the mob. Can you go get them? <laughs> we need an Uber. <laughs> we need an Uber, Mr. Shuttlesworth. Isn't that a great name? And for his name he is Shuttlesworth. Shuttlesworth. That yeah. is incredible. So he sends out eight of his deacon pastors, right, in eight separate cars, and he says, "Go get these guys, and no guns, because we're nonviolent." And they go, "You got it, boss." 
and they get in the cars and they load their guns and they show their guns as they drive to the hospital and get these kids into the car and race their asses back to Shuttleworth's parsonage where they're like, holy So they did, fucking they did bring guns. Fuck. Yeah. And that was how they all got out. And then the clan comes to Shuttleworth's house and is like, this is this integrated house. You, you can't have blacks and whites in there. And he's like, and he manages and says, we'll burn your house down if you don't throw them out. It's not like the clan ever really backs down. It's just sort of like in a horror movie where the sun rises and right. I guess people have to go back to work. Right. You know, mm-hmm. your point about the zombie movie, I think is like really well made. Right. But they're sitting in Shuttleworth's house. I mean, they can't breathe. Some of them are still coughing up blood from the fumes. And they're looking at each other going, what happened to the trailways bus? <laughs> I was going to ask that question. <laughs> I was just thinking that. What happened to the other what bus? What happened to the other bus, right? All right. So meanwhile, And they say go town, Greyhound. Maybe not. <laughs> right? The trailways bus had their problem start before they even left Atlanta. Remember, Atlanta was the edge of the cliff and next stop is Alabama. Right. So they go to buy their bus tickets to Alabama from Atlanta and they see Klan members talking to white people in line who then don't get on the bus and the Klan members buy tickets and get on the bus. Oh, fuck. So where the Greyhound bus had our two heroes with revolvers who found a spark of humanity... Trailways bus has the opposite from the get-go. These guys are openly, we're the clan. They not only get on the bus, the a verbal abuse starts right away. We know who you are. We know what you're doing. You're never going to make it out of Alabama. Echoing what Dr. King had said. And Dr. King had said to them, I've heard they know. Like, the only reason I know is because I got spies. Now, mm-hmm. which, which bus was Peck still on? Peck was, uh, is on this one. He's on the trailways. Yeah. So um, the Klan gets on and they say verbal abuse right away. You're never going to make it in Alabama. We know what's going on. And, the, and it gets worse when they cross into the state. They get to the first station, first bus station. This is where the rubber always meets the road because not only are we going to get off the bus, the quote unquote safety of the bus, but we're going to go push buttons in there. We're right. going to sit down right in their faces. We're That's gonna where the challenge. Signs. We're going to go to the bathrooms, the lunch counters, and the waiting rooms. This That's is where the, the challenge takes place. This is where the challenge takes place. And these challenges are why we're all here. Mm-hmm. So they get to the stop and the driver gets off, doesn't let, before anybody else does, and then comes back on and says, with a bunch of what they call hoodlums, and the driver says to everyone on the bus, the bus, the Greyhound bus from Atlanta was burned the riders were beaten and are who knows what happened to them at the hospital. They're going to do the same thing to our bus unless these N-words go back where they belong. Uh, there's two black men sitting together in the white section in the front of the bus, right next to where the driver and these quote unquote hoodlums come on. And they say, no, we're not going to go back. And this is our, right, we've, the Supreme Court ruling has <laughs> come down. We, technically, you have no jurisdiction. And they just start beating the fuck out of these guys. Drag them out of the seat, and the beating is immediate, and it's brutal. Jim Peck, a white guy, rushes to the front to put his body between him and the black guy, and he's beaten and as bad, if not worse. Then our 60... Year old Mr. Bergen, Mr. Bergman, let me make sure I Bergman, say it. yeah. Berman, Bergman. He leaps up to defend and he is getting it big time. And his wife is watching and she's screaming, oh my God, because they're stomping his chest. I mean, there is blood flying everywhere. At one point, one of the guys does stop the other guy from what appears to be a certain death. Don't kill him. He goes, ah, that one might kill you. And, and, all right. So then they pick up, they're all four of them unconscious. And they pick up all four of them and throw them basically in the back two seats. Drape them over the seats, throw them into the laps of their friends. Then they sit down, these clan members, in the middle of the bus and say, we're going to protect this color line. No one speaks and no one moves until we get to where we're going. And 
slowly, the guys who got their asses beaten start to regain consciousness. Jesus. Um, right about the time that they pull into Birmingham. Good timing. Mm -hmm. And the job was, the plan, we talked about the plan, was for Jim Peck, who's white in person, who's black, to go test out the lunch counter. These two guys can barely see. Jim can hardly walk. And they get off the bus and walk to the lunch counter and sit down. Wow. <laughs> this is why I'm telling you, you got to tell the specifics of these stories. Because sure. even if you just thought they got on a bus or they rented a coach, they, I mean, no, man. And the... The clan approaches them immediately inside the station and start to push person, the black guy. And he says right away, oh, you're all bloody. Did you beat up a white guy or did you beat up the white guy you're with? That will justify what we're about to do is that we can say we thought he was, you know, they were already planning. And Jim Peck steps in front of him and says, if you want to hurt him, you have to kill me. And there is a mentality among segregationists in the Deep South then and now, which is there is something worse than a black person. And it's a white person who thinks they're equal, right? An N-word lover is worse, right? And they give him just the beating of a lifetime. But they also drag him and person into this like dimly lit corridor where a bunch of other people are waiting to join in the beating. And it's chaotic and it's dark. And in the midst of this, person escapes. He like runs out and gets out into the street. I know it's like a cartoon of like the dust filled. <laughs> you know what I mean? He runs out of the bus station and gets into a, a cab driven by a black cab driver. And it, he goes to Shuttleworth. Wow. <laughs> yeah. In, how did I wonder how he knew to go to Shuttleworth? They had because some of that stuff is I, coordinated. You know what I mean? Where because right. that was where they were going to end up when they got at the end of the line. Like that's oh, our okay. destination. You know, the idea was that we'd find him eventually. So they the um, they could already kind of communicate with each other to an extent. And safe houses. You know, they would have planned some of that. Like right. worst that case sense. scenario stuff. Um. So the other riders in the meantime, not just the freedom riders, but the other passengers on that bus are like, wow, <laughs> fuck. That went from stern looks and horrible verbal abuse to they're going to kill us awfully fucking fast. Um, Jerry Moore and Herman Harris managed to like avoid detection and they run away. Frances Bergman, the wife, uh, she gets on a city bus like, there's a city bus stop nearby, and she jumps on the city bus and gets out of there. There, a, a handful of other guys get beaten. Ike Reynolds, who had come in to fill in for Farmer when he had to leave, he gets beaten and thrown into a garbage can. One Klansman gets beaten up by mistake. <laughs> Kind of wonderful. That is great. He simply came out of the men's room at the wrong time and they were like, there's another one. And he was like, nope. And it was, you know, you can enjoy that. Chew on that one as we're eating the rest. They finally, I mean, you know, get to eventual safety. They all regather um, at Shuttleworths. And there's some significant things they learn now. These two buses have gotten through and they're like, fuck, that was nuts. They definitely wanted to kill us. They still want to kill us was that there was press that did capture some of the images. And both the trailways and the Greyhound station, they had done deliberate stuff to like break cameras. You know, they were they were doing deliberate action to not have this documented because it's their right and their heritage and they love it, but don't anybody look at it because when it really shows itself in full force, we know how horribly ugly and illegal it is. And we understand the power of the media. We do. Um, but the press does capture it, and it's on the CBS News. Howard K. Smith is there doing a documentary called Who Speaks for Birmingham? And he happened to not only, Dave, catch some of the most horribly violent beatings of the day, but on camera he catches a, a particular guy named Gary Thomas Rowe, who happens to be an FBI informant on the Klan, what we now know is that not only was he participating in the beatings, which is part of what he was doing as an, I mean, that was not outside of what he knew he was going to be doing. He had told the FBI all about this. 
in advance. They're planning on getting these buses. He tells them, we were at the Greyhound station waiting for that first Greyhound bus to come. But it didn't, remember? It got hijacked right, it didn't and make burned it that far. in between. So they're sort of cooling their heels waiting for the Greyhound. And when they heard the Trailways bus was coming, they ran across town. Beautiful Sunday afternoon. All these guys in their Sunday Mother's best. Mother's Day. With clubs and chains and bricks just running from one side of Birmingham to the other because they don't want to miss a chance to be a part of this, right? But we know he told J. Edgar Hoover. And we know J. Edgar Hoover communicated some of this to the Attorney General, who at the time, of course, is Robert Kennedy. But the Freedom Riders were never warned, were never told. And in hindsight, a lot of them said what they knew. Well, yeah, everybody knew. I mean, the Freedom Riders knew what was right. coming. But an organized attack is a little different than what we expect. You know what I mean? Because this was so planned that the police of Birmingham had told the Klan, you have 15 minutes. We will have to come in and break up this mob because we have to make it look like something. But we will not arrest anyone for the first 15 minutes. You can kill them. They said specifically, kill them, burn them, do whatever you want. And at the end of that 15 minutes, they just, yeah, walk on home. I mean, that was, you know, exactly it had gone in both cases. That was always so weird. It was like, what happened? Time was up. Wow. Um, and they, I think one of the things they thought is if they could do it in 15 minutes, there wouldn't be pictures. There wouldn't be time for the media to get down there and document some of that. And people would say it and they'd see the results, but it would be, you know, somewhat inconclusive. But now they're sitting there in Birmingham one bus was lit on fire. The other one was also similarly destroyed. And they're supposed to get on a bus in the morning and go to Montgomery. Jim Peck is in the hospital. He finally regained consciousness, almost died. And the media and the Freedom Riders go and say, what are we doing tomorrow, Jim? <laughs> and he says, well, I'm getting on a bus to Montgomery. <laughs> Which... They're like, renews their spirit. They're even more like, fuck yeah, we are. But then they get to the bus station and no one will drive the bus. Yeah, I wouldn't drive that bus. No, I wouldn't either, to be <laughs> fair. I'd be like, I have a job <laughs> and I'm not a freedom rider. I live in, right? Yeah, so no one will drive the bus. But now because of this CBS News thing, mm -hmm. the Kennedys and everybody have to publicly respond. And Robert Kennedy calls the governor of Alabama and says, listen, bud. The governor um, of Alabama was? Um, let me, uh, John, uh, John Patterson. John Patterson. Yeah. So Robert Kennedy calls John Patterson, the governor of, uh, of Alabama, and says, buddy, you better get all your cars around that bus and make sure they get to fucking the end of that state line safely. And John says, fuck no. I have no responsibility for rabble rousers, for out-of-state agitators who come down here to make trouble. They came down here to make trouble. If they get trouble, they, that's what they get. I will do nothing to protect these people. I will order my police and highway patrol to do nothing on their behalf. Wow. He says to the attorney general. So he says, fuck you. Fuck you. And to the point where Robert Kennedy is on the phone with the bus company and they're saying no one will drive the bus. And he says, somebody there has to be able to drive a bus. Get these cunts out of your state. Why don't you want to get these cunts out of your state? And he is wringing hands and he did did Finally, everyone agrees. Why don't we fly out? It's a compromise. It's a concession. Because we're not getting on the bus and we're not going to go, but let's fly out of here. And they have a fucking hard time. The Klan surrounds the airport. Every time they get on a plane, there's a bomb threat and they have to turn around and go back. No pilot will fly the, another bomb threat. No, no staff. They can't get off the ground. Finally, they're like, all right, here's And Robert Kennedy's on the phone. Free, what the? I am the attorney general of the United States. And he says to Patterson, if you want the federal government to come down there, we will. We did it in 1950s. Like, we did it for the Board of Education. You want the National Guard to come down there and make you enforce the national laws? We will, and we'll embarrass you in this whole thing. And he said, yeah, fine, try it. You're not going to do it today, are you? So they finally sneak onto a plane. It's like the plane's on the runway, cleared for takeoff, and they get on and go. <laughs> and they get to New Orleans. And that was their final spot. That was the final destination. That was where they were all going. And Jim Peck's head is in a fucking bandage, and they're all fucking shaking. And they don't feel like they really did it. 
because they didn't, because they had to skip it. Because they and they didn't go near Mississippi. <laughs> they went. They flew they from Alabama. Mississippi. They flew from Alabama. But at this point, America's aware of what a freedom ride is. We have Robert Kennedy. We have Dr. King. We have these people are involved and they're mad. They don't like it. Dr. King doesn't like it. The NAACP doesn't like it. Robert Kennedy hates it. And they're all kind of like, stop. And once these fucks land in New Orleans, Robert Kennedy is like, oh, fuck. That was all the political capital I have. And it was everything I could do to save you idiots from yourself and your dumb bullshit idea. Wow. And then he gets the call. There's three more rides that have just left Washington, D.C. Wow. And he was like, what? Are you there doing it again? What? And this is when Janet Braun Reinitz chooses to be a Freedom Rider Dave. And I wanted to tell all of that before I told this part. What echoes for me is when I said I wouldn't drive that bus. And she would. Yeah. Now, the story as I know it is that by the time she got on the bus and what got her on the bus is that she met, I believe it was Jim Peck. Yes. At a party. Yes. Because my mom yes. went to the good parties. <laughs> Fuck yeah, she did. And my mom, as a New Yorker, if there was something happening in New York, she was just there. It's mm -hmm. just, it's just 9-11. She was there. Mm -hmm. She was at ground zero on 9-11. Mm -hmm. Whatever it was, humans of New York, they took her picture one day. You know, yeah. just whatever's happening, you know, Mets are losing the World Series to the Yankees, <laughs> Game 5, 2000, she's there. All it's the just, big tragedies. Something was happening in New York, Mom, was, she, she, was, she, was just, she was just there. <laughs> you know, the day they retired Jackie Robinson's number. <laughs> you know, we went to the ballpark, <laughs> you know, and that was, that, was, that was the day you have to go. And, you know, she grew up a rich girl, in Rye, New York, her father had made a bunch of money in plastics. And when she was eight, her mother died mm. of breast cancer. Mm. And her father's response was to go to Europe and leave his kids. Mm. And she was left under the care of an African-American woman who essentially took over as her surrogate mother. Mm. And she tells the story of not understanding racism. She didn't understand that it was a thing. She had no awareness of it because she went to school with white people. She was taken care of by a black woman and didn't understand, didn't see how that woman was treated by the people around. Yeah. And her first awareness of racism came from Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. And and that's what got her on this path. Mm -hmm. I listened to her interview in the Library of Congress, and when she's asked by the interviewer, how did your parents influence your decision to be a freedom writer? She says they didn't. And then she clarifies by saying that they were wealthy and that they were immigrants who believed in upward mobility and the American dream, and that she saw there wasn't a lot of happiness in that. And she was rejecting that. She didn't mention it's interesting that she was raised um, by a black nanny. That wasn't something that she had volunteered in that interview. But then she says, so they did influence me tremendously, but not by example. And I thought that was such an interesting way to put it. Yes. Well, when she, as soon as she was of age, she rejected her family and went off on her own. I'm really honored to be able to tell the story of her ride. And, um, and it takes place in July. So May, Mother's Day, was that first one. That's when it, the bus burns in Aniston. And she's a member of CORE. She's been working for CORE in New York City for a while. And she's at a party, she said. And she sees Jim Peck and he's still bandaged. 
And she said he wasn't a young man. He was in his 40s and she was 23. And she explains to the interviewer that she thought if he can do it, maybe I can, but they probably wouldn't want me because she said I had no clout and I wasn't very mature. What would I be able to do? But she put her name in. And that when they called her and said, can you go next week? She said, yes, <laughs> and was shocked that, that they even wanted her because you had to be pretty scrutinized. They really didn't accept anyone. It wasn't like any idiot who would get on these rides could go. You had to have a letter of recommendation. You had to write an essay explaining why you wanted to go and what your commitment was to nonviolence. She was newly married to your dad. And she said he was really jealous. He really wanted to go with her. But he made most of the money and they had just gotten married and they couldn't quite take that leap to they together. couldn't they couldn't both go they couldn't both go um her bus leaves from St. Louis, Missouri and she you you talk about her realization of, of what I I can empathize with that realizing racism as a white person who's from the north it's a disorienting thing just to see it and to know that this is a reality that isn't in another country. It's not in another time. It's just been outside of your experience, you know? And remembering that she's a Jewish woman. And she's Jewish. It's so important for you to point out that she's Jewish. She's rejected her parents in the sense that she's not um, part of a or Jewish organization, but she is, yeah. And, and she grew up with, you know, the shadow of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And certainly relatives of both sides of my family were victims of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was what the interviewer was after, is my guess. When they ask her, how did your parents experience right. influence being a freedom rider? Right. And she said, it didn't. Because... While it may have made her very aware of persecution as it exists in the world, it didn't inspire a spirit of service or revolution in them as individuals. I think that is what she was saying. That, that well, they had been on the receiving end of persecution had influenced them. Right. But remembering her mother died when she was a young girl. Right. And so essentially this is the influence of her father, her father. who was, you know, he was more than anything a, you know, a narcissistic capitalist. Sure. That, yeah. that, that was really his, his yeah. life's path. And yeah. so, you know, he, I don't think he was an active racist, but I don't think he gave a shit about it one way or another. Sure. Apathy. Can apathy. Be. Mm -hmm. Apathy. Um, she says when she sees her first white only, whites only signs, she just bursts into tears, which I found so fascinating because at that point she had already been through the training. Mm -hmm. where they had made sure that they could experience some of that abuse. They knew what they were getting involved with, working with CORE. She had seen Jim Peck, but seeing the whites only sign, just that had her burst into tears. Um, there are five Freedom Riders on her bus, a black man and a black woman and a white man and a white woman, and then a fifth person as the don't get arrested witness. They uh, leave from St. Louis. And, oh, and also on the bus is Ben Cox, who was a freedom rider who was in Anniston. He was on the bus in Anniston. He had seen the flames. He had been, you know, not allowed into the hospital. And she says, he, we were all so na naive. And she was, I could tell he was the one that was like, just don't get too comfortable, you know, kind of reminding everybody, be aware, be alert. They also told them, the, the women in particular, to dress very conservatively. Because, again, they're not trying to draw attention. The right. goal is to do this actually without being noticed. If they can just go in, get served, get back on the bus and go, great. And hopefully nobody will even bother us. And the goal is to not get arrested. Often, if you were warned you're sitting in a, a whites-only section, they'll warn you three times. They'll say, we're going to warn you three times and then we'll arrest you. On the second warning, get up and leave. Don't get arrested. That's not the point on this one. That comes later. That comes later. And also, she said, I was real arty. She said, I took out my gold, my giant gold hoops, and I put in little pearls. Mm -hmm. I put my hair up nice. They said, if you have white gloves and a hat, that would be best. And she definitely had white gloves and a hat. And so she did. Um, the first arrest is in Little Rock. Um, 
they can tell Ben Cox, who was on that bus in Aniston, says to them, everybody, something's up. He can tell there's a, a lot of people on their porches watching them. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that the local paper not only knew they were coming, but had published in the paper their route into the station. So by the time the bus pulled into the station in Little Rock, there was a mob of 500 plus people. Aniston, it was 50. Birmingham, it was 50 to 60. 500 people waiting for that bus. And they get out and they go into the bus station. So So they get out of the bus, they get into the station. They get into the station, they sit down, desegregate, right? Mm -hmm. The space, the cops come. And the plan is, get up or you're going to get arrested. And then they get up and get back on the bus. But they can't get back on the bus because the crowd is out there. So basically now the choice is, get arrested or go get beaten to death. And so they get arrested. (laughs) Yep. So they all get arrested and they get taken to the Little Little Rock Jail, which your mother describes as being very clean and air conditioned (laughs) in a brand new shiny jail. (laughs) And... um, the they're separated, of course, because it's a black man, black woman, white man, black woman. So all four of them are separated in individual cells. And the, so the observer was not arrested. No. And had gone on to get their rides, is out there probably hauling, getting the lawyers, trying to call everybody, tell tell core. So once what's these going four on. were arrested, then mm-hmm. the crowd let the others get back on the bus and go. Uh yeah. Because even if they, yeah, exactly. So they wouldn't identify themselves as a freedom writer. It just would have been like, you aren't violating the laws, so you can go. Right. Right. They're not sitting where they're not supposed to. They're not doing anything, so they're free to go. The cell, of course, she was in was only with other white women, but those women were in trauma. One of the women was um, pregnant and having a, a withdrawal from heroin and... There was a huge, there was a huge woman who had thrown her husband out of a moving car. I bet he had it coming. <laughs> he had it coming. She, um, all the toilets faced the guards. So it was just the depravity and the humiliation. She's there over the weekend. I remember her saying at different times in my life when we would go to protests and things, mm-hmm. she would always say, uh, listen, it's Friday, so we're definitely not getting arrested today. <laughs> So if you get arrested, uh-huh. you get arrested on a Monday or a Tuesday. You can get out the next day. <laughs> yeah. That's really Never funny. get arrested on a Friday. Oh, my God. I, I'm going to keep that one in my back pocket. Eventually, after the weekend, on Monday, the judge come, comes back to work, and they're found guilty, and they're given the sentence of six months pick and peas, basically. But then the judge is like, I'm not going to do that. You claim no con, you plead no contest, and then you get the fuck out of town today. And they're like, great. And they get out, and they go to dinner where they're rearrested because the police come and get them because that judge had no authority. We would really like to beat you guys. You know what I mean? Like we really want a shot at you guys. So they're rearrested and go back to jail. Same jail. One more night. Then the next day, the lawyers, the powers that be, core, whatever, they're like, you know, where you're going to go out of town today, you can go. And there is a helicopter. There is an escort right up to the state line where they all disappear and they're back on their own again. And she describes it as that was the only jail experience, but the rest of the trip was more harrowing. Um, Because after they leave Little Rock, then they go to Pine Bluff. It's fairly uneventful, harsh words, harsh stares, but no arrest. Um, Texarkana, Texas deep in the heart of Texas, hot as fuck. It's July. They are sort of inhumanely detained, made to sit on the bus for a long period of time in the heat, but eventually get back on the bus and go on without um, too much difficulty. Then they get to Shreveport, Louisiana, the headquarters of the KKK. There's obviously clans all over the Southern states, but this is the national headquarters for the Klan. And she says it is the most terrifying thing she'd ever seen. And in this 19, in this 2001 interview, she says, I saw the towers come down and this is the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen. Um, They, um, there are snipers on the tops of all the buildings and there are drooling dogs pulling against change, snarling and snapping at their legs. 
And the crowd of people is so cruel. The looks on their faces are twisted and angry. So many angry women, she points out. So much for sisterhood, she says. So many angry women. And um, one of their friends, again, because you talk about the power of these witnesses <laughs> watching, they get cars. They're like, this is bad. And so they have a friend with two cars who's basically there so that when you guys get off the bus and you go and you try to test the facilities, you have two waiting cars that are going to be right here in case you have to run out get the car. But they're able to go in, they test the facilities, then they get out and they get back on the bus and they get back on the bus and they go and they meet with local clergy and local civil rights uh, workers who are so grateful and they're saying this is so important. And she has a very difficult time because they are feeling that crowd from that town getting closer and closer, even to just where they're having their meetings. And they're starting to think like, this is bad. We have to get on that bus out of here as soon as possible. And at two o'clock in the morning, there's a 2 a.m. bus. They literally sneak onto the bus and get out of Shreveport and without anybody noticing. They get through Baton Rouge with no arrest and ultimately successfully pull into New Orleans on a Freedom Ride bus. And your mom is one of four to be the first to sit at a segregated lunch counter in New Orleans. And they ate their meal and they left. And I think it's one of the craziest things of this whole story is that she doesn't remember how she got home. Of course she doesn't. She said, I'm pretty sure I flew. <laughs> and I'm thinking anybody who flies a plane in 1961, I feel like I don't know how metropolitan you are, but it's still a big deal to take a flight in 1961. But she has no memory of that. She well, doesn't she, know how she got home. She had been to Europe and she yeah. had, you know, tranced around Europe. I mean, she'd been... You know, she she was like you. She had a <laughs> she had a monstrous sense of adventure. She was something, man. Yeah, what a yeah. slice of history. What a slice. Yeah, it was it was really uh, it was illuminating to me. And I am, you know, you know, I do this all the time. I'm constantly sort of plugging my nose and jumping into some new vat of time, place characters, personalities, and I'm trying deliberately to surround myself with what must it have been like and who was there and why is this important? And every now and, and then I get out of that when I jump into the next, you know, issue. And I, and it is a little bit of like that one was done and this is new and it's part of what I love about this. Mm -hmm. But there are some of these stories that just, I'm not going to say they stick to me. They grow on me. They become part of me. Do you know what I mean? Like an ex like any experience you have that changes you, realizations change you. It's why they're so dangerous. It's why people will try to prevent you from learning things because once you have received a certain amount of information, you can't unlearn it. You can never go backwards. Correct. And I like this. I like having this new voice in my head. It's nice. And, you know, there's something to be said for, you know, as a young person, having a life and death experience. Yeah. Because for her, that was a life and death experience. She talked about the fear. She talked about mm -hmm. burning crosses on the side of the road. She talked about, you know, not knowing whether she would ever see New York City again and her husband and, and have a future. Mm -hmm. And I think when you, whatever age you are, when you face the realization that life is short and it could be taken at any minute, it allows you to escape a lot of fear. Mm. And, you know, she was a very fearless person. And by fearless, I don't mean she didn't feel fear, but it, she accepted her fear and she moved forward anyway. And, yeah. you know, that's a great lesson for all of us. And it's a constant, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Fear is not supposed to make us run away. Fear, no. is, that is not fear's function, right? Right. Oh, Dave. I think I'm just so grateful. You're going to have a lot of editing to do on this one, huh? Yeah, so what? I always do. <laughs> Actually, this is a good opportunity to let people know that there's always a bonus episode oh. from, from each one, in part because I edit out stuff that is wonderful, because mm -hmm. I try to keep the episode to a certain length and flow of story and all of that, but there's always 
dialogues and stories and tangents and realizations that I can't quite leave on the cutting room floor. So to you, Dave, and to my listeners, know that this conversation is longer. And if you really want to get around this table with us, get your hands around a mug and hear Dave cry and me cry, join us in the bonus. We'll see you there. And could you also put a link to her website so some people can see her artwork? Please. Yes, certainly. And your artwork. And my you artwork. You can find Boom Diggity. <laughs> Boom Diggity Glass Boom diggity at Etsy. Oh. Two G's, two T's, Boom Diggity Glass. <laughs> funniest guy. Yes. It is the Etsy. funniest page on Etsy, and I would just love to sell one thing. So, will somebody please go buy one of his mushrooms, Buy one please. thing. Buy one thing. <laughs> oh, thanks again to Dave Reinitz. And, of course, to his mother, Janet Brom Reinitz. May her memory be an inspiration to all of us. Check out the show notes to find her full interview in the Library of Congress. Then, you know, why don't you send this episode to somebody you know in Texas or Florida or Mississippi or Alabama or Arkansas? (laughs) In the meantime, our next new episode is the incredible story of Josephine Baker, a poor black girl from St. Louis, Missouri, who dazzles Paris and fucking thwarts Hitler. (laughs) Do not miss it. Until then, our theme song was composed and performed by Kat Perkins. A reminder that you can find my sources, links to the books, documentaries, and articles I reference in the summary of this episode or by emailing us, hilfpodcast at gmail.com or messaging us on social media at hilfpodcast. This has been Hilf. History I'd like to fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody. Reminding you that history is a party and everybody's coming. (laughs) 